Barbara Ehrenreich's curiosity um, and her uh, range of interests, um, even though she has a degree in cellular immunology, a PhD actually, from Rockefeller University, the range of her writing is astonishing. And I'll just be really honest, when I applied for this job 12 plus years ago, it was Barbara Ehrenreich having been here 18 months before I took the job that actually kind of sealed the deal for me. That's um, the kind of place Town Hall, I'm not kidding, actually. That's the kind of place Town Hall is and the kind of writer and thinker she is. Uh, her books include um, uh, Blood Rights, Origins and History of the Passions of War, Nickel and Dime, as I mentioned, Global Woman on Nannies, Maids, and Sex Workers in the New Economy. That was co-written with Arlie Hookshield, who was actually here at Town Hall in February. Um, Bait and Switch the, on the Pursuit of the American Dream, uh, Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy from 2007, and um, Living with a Wild God, A Non-Believer's Search for the Truth About Everything from 2014, which was the, was the occasion of her last visit to Town Hall. She'll be in conversation tonight with Ross Reynolds, the executive producer of Community Engagement at KUOW. He creates community conversations for the stations such as the Ask Us series and occasionally produces arts and news features. Um, together they will discuss natural causes, an epidemic of wellness, the certainty of dying, and killing ourselves to live longer. Please join me in welcoming Barbara Ehrenreich and Ross Reynolds. How many of you heard Barbara today on the record on KUOW? She was trash talking Alan Cumming for his diet <laughs> of quinoa. <laughs> but he gave it right back to you, right? It would? He gave it right back to you in terms of criticism. Well, it was a real crash, clash of cultures. Um, in the green room, he was eating some kind of suspicious brown soup. And I said, hmm, what's that? I'm thinking maybe chili con carne. And he said, quinoa soup. And I said, well, what I have here is Carl's Jr. Uh, chicken strips. <laughs> so right from the beginning. Um, Barbara, there's so much to talk about in this book, Natural Causes. You begin the book with a revelation about our immune system that you say is both a scientific puzzle and also has deep moral reverberations what is that revelation that you begin the book with? Well, uh, I should uh, tell you that I, I was briefly a cellular immunologist. Um, probably a lot of people pass through that in their many, <laughs> many jobs and careers. But, uh, and I studied a kind of cell called macrophages. Do not call them microphages. They're macrophages. They're big cells and they're big eaters. They're the front line defenders of the body against microbes or anything that might foreign that might enter the blood stream. And in about 2009, I read an article in Scientific American saying that new research was beginning to show that macrophages um, actually help cancer spread around the body. Now think of that. These, these cells were the good guys. I saw them as the heroes. And they would crowd around a tumor and everybody said, oh, they must be getting ready to fight the tumor. No. They were conducting the tumor cells into the bloodstream and then helping them uh, set up colonies in new, new spots. I just felt betrayed, <laughs> shocked. I mean, because I was, you know, think, you think the body is a sem sensible place, right, where everything is working together to keep us alive? Uh-uh. This book is how they are. There's a lot of internal rebellion going on in all of us. And treason. Treason, yeah. You so, want to see it that way. <laughs> so you also talk about this as being, having moral reverberations. Why does that aspect of our body have moral reverberations? Well, I think that the, especially the uh, holistic view of the body has been one of sort of 
goodness and harmony and everything working together. And if you could just get your thoughts in tune right, you would have a perfectly working immortal kind of system. So it's a shock to find out that the body, rather than being this lovely harmonious in interaction of things, is actually kind of a battleground. Within yourself. And within ourselves. Yeah. You, the subtitle of this book is Killing Ourselves to Live Longer. What do you mean by that? You know, I have to tell you, uh, authors don't make up titles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My original idea of a title was going to be Old Enough to Die. Because <laughs> that was, you know, part of this thing. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm old enough. It doesn't, it's not a tragedy if a person of over 75 dies. But the publisher figured out that that would not make it a good birthday present for your mom. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, you take it away, guys. You know, I, whatever you want. <laughs> but you are very critical in the book about the methods and means we take to live longer, the kind of tests we subject ourselves to, oh, and yeah. over-medicalization. Well, the, you could say one of the emphases for this book is I began to realize over the last couple of decades that my friends, my relatives, people somewhat in my age cohort were really getting in to these things about their bodies. You know these people, this is Seattle, this is the West Coast. They, they curate their diets so they can get the, every micronutrient in there and cleanse themselves. They cleanse themselves. The body is full of microbes. The gut is full of microbes, I should say. And, and then they were beginning to exercise. And, and I finally realized that they were spending more time prolonging, trying to prolong their lives than they were actually living their lives. And, and in fact, you write that we'd all like to live longer and healthier lives. The question is how much of our lives should be devoted to that project, which is a provocative thing to raise, but is there a right or wrong answer to that question? For some, no, it might I, be more, I, I for don't. others, it might be less. I don't, I don't think so. I'm, yeah. I'm not a dogmatist about this, but mm. I will say it's a good idea to spend some of your last years playing, you know, having a good time. Uh, but I think that the, it makes me sad to see how many people of sort of my general age cohort having their whole lives now planned around what they put in their mouths, um, what, you know, how much they exercise, timing it all, measuring it all, and then going to all the preventive uh, testing that doctors will push on us. Well, I'm sure you know some of those people, and you may have even met more of those people on this book tour. Um, what do they what do they say to you and how do you respond to them when they say, I just want to live longer? I prize life, I want to stay around longer. Well now we're getting kind of philosophical and I get nervous getting philosophical in this kind of setting. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, um, well I, I haven't you know it's funny, I can't really say it to some people like in my family. But what I want to say... Well, now you wrote the book and it's out of the bag. Huh? Now you wrote the book and it's out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, now I know. <laughs> but what I want to say is, what are you living for? What, you know, why, do you really, are you really concerned about whether you get to be 94 or 96? You know, what, what, what is this about? You know, what, what are we doing, what, what is our, purpose, you know, and each of us has a different purpose. But I certainly have a lot of things to do, and I want to do them, uh, but I'm also eager to pass them on to younger people. And I'm doing that, actually, in my life. So have you answered that question for yourself about how much of your life you want to spend to live longer? And how, what kind of answers have you come to? <laughs> well. Part of the exercise. answers came in to me in, as revelations, I can say that here, in, um, <laughs> in doctor's waiting rooms. 
Why are doctors' waiting rooms decorated in a fashion that makes you want to shoot yourself? <laughs> Have you ever noticed, you know, that sort of faux, cozy, corporate look? But also a little dingy in my case. So I would be waiting for, you know, to have some scan or something the doctor had ordered. I'd say, wait a minute. This is a nice day. I could be outdoors. Or I could be finishing that article and meet my deadline. You know, I just did so many things. Why am I in this torture chamber? Are there procedures that in times past you would go and get tested for that you've kind of let go in your life because you figure it's just oh, not yeah. worth it? I have gradually shed all the testing procedures that are inflict inflicted on the elderly. And well, it started for not elderly, started in my 50s, being really critical and really asking questions. And that I got from participating in the feminist health movement in the 70s and 80s. Always question everything. You know, do not, when they say do this, check it out first. You know, do a little research. Um, so uh, it gave up, um, well, some of these things I had never done, but some of them I, I just rejected outright. Colonoscopy? What? You know, <laughs> you want to do what? <laughs> so, um, and then a little research showed that this country does far more of them than other countries, other so-called advanced Western countries, because they do a non-intrusive test first to see if there's a need for anything as invasive as a colonoscopy. So I thought, uh-uh, uh, let's do the, if you want to do something, you can do the non-invasive thing. They don't, they don't want to do that. Colonoscopies can pay uh, the doctor or the, you know, the, whatever the place is that does it, um, $10,000 a shot or, you know, somewhere in that range. It's crazy. So I gave up that. Um, let's see, bone density scans. I call them bone density scams. <laughs> were basically invented by or pushed by a Merck pharmaceutical company because they invented uh, a drug, a, a drug, Fosamax. Some of you may have heard of it. It's supposed to strengthen your bones. And so Merck went around to doctors saying, you need to get the screening e equipment so you can find out which of your patients is a customer for us. And so I was very dubious. I did it, I did, went through the scan and I found out, I was told I had a disease, osteopenia, which just about, it just means the beginning of the frailty of the bones, which just about every woman over, beyond menopause has. So I said, oh, that's no disease then. That's just part of aging. Leave me alone, I don't want to take the phosphorax, one of which, the side effects of which can be bone fractures. I bet, <laughs> irony. What else did I put? Um, Mammography? Yep. And I'm somebody who had, who had um, breast cancer about 20 years ago. And so I was, you know, at first pretty dutiful about going for the annual mammogram, something which every woman hates. You know, the idea of, may, of pounding your breast uh, to make it transparent, that's what they're really trying to do. And so, uh, you know, I went through these, and then, I don't know, five, six years ago, they told me, oh, you had a bad mammogram. Oh, I freaked. I really did. Um, and I actually got uh, into a little conflict, a traffic conflict with a police officer. And I was so nervous. I was just a wreck. But finally, you know, went through the other, a few of the other tests. And they said, oh, that, they said, it's not a bad mammogram. It's just that with the new kind of mammography that we're using, there are so many false positives. Well, that, you know, a false positive 
could have led to a biopsy and other forms of torture. So I went to a fancy um, oncologist and I said, what do you think of this? He said, I wouldn't bother with mammograms anymore. I said, fine, and dropped them. Are there any procedures that when you did your own independent, independent investigation, you thought, no, this is actually worth doing it even though it might be uncomfortable or I don't particularly like it? Did it kind of pass your test of, yes, this is worth it? Um, well, I think there were for other age groups. And <laughs> I have been concerned um, for many, many years about lead poisoning screening. Yeah. What am I losing? I'm gonna move this back over here. Keep talking, I'll just put it over here. What are you, a hairdresser? <laughs> <laughs> I am tonight, Barbara. Uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. Uh, was there some kind of like a horn coming out of my... You, you can't feel it. It just can fall uh -huh. out without you noticing it. And I, I mean, it. Did, it, did it look funny? No. no. Like a horn? Again. You know. <laughs> 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 um, but... You know, so lead poisoning testing, screening for kids for that, preventive care, uh, prenatal care, um, postnatal care. Do you know we are have, maternal mortality is actually rising in this country, which is crazy. It's been going down for decades, and it's rising especially uh, uh, among black women in the South. Figure that out. Um, so there are all kinds of things that doctors can do, and other allied pro health professionals that are important and are necessary and are not being done. We have a country where I, I keep record of every case I can find where young where children have died because their parents couldn't afford a dentist to pull an infected tooth. I mean, actually, a veterinarian could pull an infected tooth. But, so, but everything is skewed toward the elderly or toward the older people. Once you hit 65, you are ripe for another kind of encounter with the medical profession where they just, they want to do a lot of things to you. You are a money source. And, you know, it, it's, all, it's all skewed in a crazy way. That, that's certainly true that the medical profession often is pushing these things for their own profit. But is it not also true that in this era where I, I think we don't always just do what the doctor says, we get to be consumers of health care. As consumers, people ask for these tests. They want these things to be done, no matter how expensive they are and how uncomfortable they are. Right, and each uh, one of these tests um, has a, um, like a, a celebrity um, who leads the, um, <laughs> you know, for the case for screening, Katie Couric. Um, colonoscopies. Um, uh, okay, let's see if I Rudy Giuliani, prostate testing. <laughs> Who am I leaving out? Well, you know, mammograms are promoted by a whole thing, the um, awareness movement for, for breast cancer, which is mainly, you know, in a way, shilling for the um, equipment industry. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I think there's a, there is pressure that comes from consumers. And some people, doctors, in fact, complain when they say, look, we don't do annual exams anymore because they don't have, you know, just st statistical studies show they have no effect. And then people, some people get mad about that. But <clears throat> the trend has been toward dropping this is a medical profession, dropping more and more of these preventive tests because they really don't do much. Hmm. You know, I know I, some doctor here will leap up and say, no, no, I insist. But there's a lot of, but hey, let me tell you what you do when they, when they um, <coughs> try to um, get you to submit to some new test or procedure. Google that next to the word controversy. <laughs> and you find out that the doctors don't agree it, or use the term evidence-based in the procedure. And that shows, 
what studies have been show, done to show or not show <coughs> that this procedure does any good in large populations. So that's what you do. Have any of you had a chance to read Natural Causes at all? I, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, there's just so many parts of it uh, that just immediately get you thinking, just sentences, sentences like this. You write that the truly sinister possibility is that for many of us, all the little measures we take to remain fit, all the deprivations and exertions will only lead to a longer chance to live a crippling and humiliating with disabilities. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, I, I, had, I got that thought from um, um, the New York Times, mm -hmm. you know, when their science section, saying, well, what, what are we really accomplishing? I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people I know think that every half hour on a treadmill is giving them three more minutes of life at the end. You know, and it, that, that, that this is a terrifying fact, that we, we get more disabled with age. May I say that? I mean, I am a, an exercise nut. I have also injured my back badly uh, by doing imprudent things or show off things in the gym. I, I was a big, I mean, I, I could still show you a few muscles, but um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, we're not, we're not doing enough evaluating of that. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? What, I'm getting, what I'm get, am I getting out of it? Are there other things I would rather do? I happen to enjoy exercising a lot. So that passes another test, but um, sitting in doctor's offices, no, never. You, you, one of the other things that you write is, you could say there's something almost altruistic about the disease of aging. What's altruistic about that? <clears throat> well, I mean, if you were being really hard-nosed Darwinist, you'd say, what do we need old people for, right? What are we just sitting around taking up space, um, generating plastic waste and all the other things we do? Um, <clears throat> so, from a strictly Darwinist perception, we have reproduced. If we were going to reproduce, we're not really needed anymore uh, in a biolog in that biological sense. Though, let me put a little asterisk here and say there is a theory, the grandma theory of evolution, <laughs> I love this, I'm a grandma, um, that says that, you know, surviving grandmas do a lot to help the survival of their grandchildren. I like that. Uh, it's true, I've done a lot, so I'm very involved with mine, but, um, you know, fundamentally we don't know. What do we do, you know, should we stay, should we go? Uh, I'm not for, uh, what were they called, death panels? Mm -hmm. Or anything like that, no, everybody should live as possible, long as they possibly can and enjoy, and enjoy themselves. But the questions I think have really come up about medicalized dying. You know, getting into a situation where you can't really speak anymore, stand up for yourself, and they're doing more and more procedures to shock you back into life. Uh, you know, which may mean just a few days of absolute torture. And people are rejecting that kind of medicalized death. I'm rejecting a medicalized life. You uh, assault, the, you go get after the idea of, of the mind-body linkage linkage of mindfulness being able to control things, actually about our very notion of being able to control some of these things. It seems as though part of what you're saying in this book is that we have to, actually you say it straight up, we have to have a humility about this and not think that we can control everything. Right. Yeah, I would say humility, but also that's what some of the latest science is pointing to. I was very lucky to come to some of these questions at the time, at this time when I was doing the research because there have been fantastic breakthroughs in the study of cells. And the, the most important one from the point of view, my point of view in this book, 
is that some cells are doing what they want to do, which is not necessarily any good for us. An example would be cancer. What is cancer? A cell or a couple of cells decide, hey, what are we doing? Sitting here doing their jobs all the time. You know, there's always been this view of the body as a communist dictatorship where every cell happily contributes to the collectivity, you know, the collective. And, but I, I get the sense, you know, every now and then one says, hey, let's get out of here. I don't like just being here in the pancreas or the breast or whatever. Let's rampage through the body, take over new, new, new outposts and colonies, and reproduce like fiends. That's cancer. That's a rebellion against the tyranny of you know being cells in the body. Uh, there are other things that really disrupt the harmonious perspective of especially the um, holistic people. Uh, that's, that's not a good word, but you know what I mean? People are all about holism, the body is harmonious. Autoimmune diseases, that's ghastly. That's the immune cells that are supposed to fight microbes saying, hmm, no, let, let's fight our, let's fight these um, um, kidney cells or something else. Let's, let's invade the uh, arterial, um, the arteries going to the heart. Let's, you know, make mischief. It, you can think about the immune system as, as this is a common metaphor, not just mine, uh, as analogous to a garrison, a military garrison that a village maintains or a town. You depend on them to defend you, but they can turn on you too. They can start looting, they can start, you know, be, becoming dictators themselves. And that's what's happened, that's what our immune system is. It's a very uneasy relationship. I've left out some other, oh, Good example. No, I told you about the example of breast cancer, of cancer and the immune system cells spreading it, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, this idea that our cells are like in there conspiring and, and thinking about what they're gonna do next and deciding to do something bad instead of something good. You, t you talk about agency, but it's not, it's, it's a metaphor to think, they don't really have minds of their own. They're, they're simple, tiny little things in our body. So what is it that makes them go from good to bad? Do, do we know what that is? Do we have any idea what makes them flip? No, we don't. And, and, it's, and the cells that I focus on and the, that are central to so, so many of the these illnesses that have to do with inflammation, like the ailments that come with aging, such as arthritis, the cells I focus on are the macrophages. I'm sorry, you, I know you came tonight because you are really interested in macrophages, <laughs> right? These, these cells are like amoeba, which are completely self-sufficient cells. They roam around the body looking for things to eat. Uh, that macrophage means big eater. Uh, and they, they do that very destructively sometimes. But what makes them decide things? All right, not a nervous system. How can a cell have a nervous system? But they are getting a lot of input all the time. Chemical signals are coming to them from the fluid around them. And they're jostling with other cells and they're moving around. And I, I liken this to myself, walking around on a busy sidewalk, a crowded sidewalk, and I'm jostling against other people I'm getting cell phone messages, you know, telling me to pick up some, you know, milk on the way home, and I've got all these things going on, and I got a lot of cells to process this with, and I have to come to a decision as to the path I'm taking. Will a macrophage or some other free-ranging cell in our body getting signals, jostling with other cells, and somehow integrating that into decisions. Decisions is a pretty funny word to use about cells, but cellular biologists are now using it.
just in the last 10 years. So I came along at a time when the paradigm was beginning to shift. Not that most scientists really realize that. I guess you have to come from the outside a little bit and say, do you just see what happened here? When I was a graduate student in cell biology, everything was deterministic. Any feminists here remember when we railed that biology was so deterministic? It's not so much anymore. Um, you write about the mind and body being linked and as this really not being as true as many people would like that to be um, and because of some of the things that you just mentioned. But you also write a lot in this book about agency, about something being able to change something else. And you talk a lot about our lack of agency despite our desire, our, our feeling as though we do have agency. And you also talk about the psychological basis of that. We're, we're predisposed to think that we have more control than we do. Am I paraphrasing you correctly? Yeah. Um, actually, I should... Could, I, could you write that down and give it to me sometime? <laughs> um, <laughs> very good. Um, yes, this is a lot about agency. The first part of the book is about our various attempts to dominate our own bodies. You know, because the whole idea of the fitness movement and the dietary obsessions of people, etc., is that you can control your body, you know, with whatever micronutrients we put in and kombucha and I don't, I don't know. <laughs> the whole idea of green drinks, I'm not down with, no. Um, so there's, there's all these efforts to control which are not evidence-based in, in most cases. And then the rest of the book goes off more into why we can't control it, our bodies. Although we are connected and obviously if we're going through extreme stress, for example, um, lots of bad things happen to our bodies. And that was found basically by torturing animals in labs. And you know, scientists, you know, um, and, and seeing that extreme stress does these things. And we know in our lives it does. If you experience a sudden loss of a person you love, you know, everything goes. You know, they just never, there is a connection. But we cannot turn that around and say, hey, I think I'll think positive thoughts, or whatever it is, or be mindful, and then everything will fall into place. Nothing infuriated me more when I was being treated for breast cancer uh, in 2000 and 2001, then the advice that you think positively to get through your cancer. And it's not just, not just breast cancer. You've, many people here have heard that, right? Think positively. I was in a rage the whole time. So I could say, hey, you want to recover from breast cancer? Get into a rage, you know? Express your anger. Uh, it, it, we, we don't know what we're doing with these things. Yes, meditation is probably a good thing, but as I uh, show in the book, recent research shows um, that probably, you know, a, sh a short period of meditation, maybe even, I don't know what's a short period here, but 20 minutes or something, does no more for you than like sitting and having a glass of wine with friends <laughs> or solving a difficult math problem finally or something like that. But, you know, whatever, if you want to do it, um, it, it does not control our bodies. Um, this is sad. You mentioned earlier, at, and you write this in the book, that uh, you realized you were old enough to die. What made you realize that? Was it a gradual realization? <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to call the book Old Enough to Die, and the publisher pointed out nobody would give it to his mother for her birthday. Um, so it became natural causes. But 
it, it wasn't so much a great, you know, personal revelation. I was just thinking about obituaries and, and the coverage of deaths. Before the age of, say, early 70s or 70s, you know, they'll, they'll give you some explanation maybe of how, why, why the person died, you know. But at a certain age, nah, it's, um, you know, natural causes, whatever, or, um, no, I, kn I know at my age, if I die, no one is going to call it a tragedy. I'm just going by the obits, right? And nobody is going to demand an investigation. Well, if I die right after this, uh, I would want you to look into Ross and the other people <laughs> I have interacted with. But, uh, you know, it's, it, we, because, and that carries with it the implicit assumption that, whoops, um, it's moving in on me again. I don't know what they're putting into me with these wires. <laughs> goes over there. There you go. What, 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 are, what are you trying to find out with this wire? <laughs> you know, when I start putting wires in your brain. Um, so, well, where were we? When you, um, you write that and you say that I realized I was old enough to die, but you also say you recognize that <clears throat> some people might think that is, as defeatist, but you call it that realization of victory. Why is it a victory? Oh, no, just a great relief. You know, say, huh. I'm old enough to die. I can take a rest if I want. If I want to take a walk along the river in the town where I live, instead of going to a doctor's office, I'm damn well going to take the walk. This, I'm, I, I feel freer. I have a big issue. I've had a big issue with friends over the issue of butter uh, for years. <laughs> I come from a family that put butter on everything including brownies. Um, we would have put butter on butter itself, except for the problems of traction at the butter-butter interface. And then along comes this health craze in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And a friend said to me, are you going to put butter on that bread? damn straight, um, <laughs> bread is a vehicle for butter. <laughs> so, uh, I am old enough to eat butter, drink alcohol, smoke the occasional smokable substance, and, you know, that's great. I, I, I am not going, I'm not going to spend my last year's on a project of deprivation. <laughs> Let's eliminate fat. Let's eliminate alcohol. No. No. My plans for the, my final years are, one, hedonism. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe I'll get interested in sex again and have unsafe sex. <laughs> um, and two, doing my work. I, you know, I have, I have too much to do. You know, that's, that's it. Well, how about drugs? Uh, you talk a bit about psilocybin that's, as, a, as the use of That's what psilocybin. you're measuring? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, um, I think um, Michael Pollan is going to be following along in my footsteps and the book tour trail soon. And I learned a lot from an article he wrote about... Um, studies now being done at Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School on the use of psilocybin. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yes. Anybody who corrects me, I'm suspicious of here. Um, <laughs> which I guess is the magic mushroom ingredient. Yes. Why are you so knowledgeable? <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, they were experimenting with giving it to people who are terrified of dying, yet are dying. Uh, I read the case of a man in his 50s who had a kind of an expiration date ahead of him and was terrified, as many of us are, about, about dying. 
So they gave him a little psilocybin over this series of weeks. He was absolutely, you know, he absolutely chilled. It was okay. He saw, he saw something which we can all imagine and made sense to me, that the universe is, al is alive. I'm not saying it's some being, some god, but it's just full of life. Even dead, inert matter is full of life. He saw that, and he saw the beauty of it, and then it didn't matter that he personally was going to die. I, I've felt that for a long time, that, you know, I, I'll be out of here, but the things I love, I hope, will go on. Um, let's say, little bracket here, short of nuclear war, global warming, and a few other terrif truly terrifying things. But I, I think the work that has been important to me, which has mainly been about poverty and class and inequality, um, yeah, I'm passing the torch all the time. I am so proud of the people, younger people, we have mentored and supported through the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, which I founded a few years ago, but do not run day to day because that would be a disaster. And um, you can check us out, check out our, our website. We do beautiful, meaningful work that gets all over the media. And we, in the process, we are bringing up young writers, often in poverty. Well, most writers are in poverty, but um, <laughs> like a, a, a young woman from Washington State who was for years a, a single mom and a house cleaner for her income. And we found her while writing about being in that situation. We, we got her writing, um, her first, one of the first big things she wrote was in the New York Times, which is major. She got a book contract. Her book will be out in the fall or something. Um, and um, I'm very, very, very proud of her. The book will be called Made, M-A-I-D. And she, her life is transformed. And I could talk about other people who've been through this process. And I know, um, try to get the names right, that she will, you know, continue and pa pass my life mm -hmm. and to say things I w might have wanted to say if I had known them. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Speaking of that type of writing, are you familiar with the book Evicted? It was just a, a masterful study of how eviction affects people in oh, this country. Oh, I loved that book. It was amazingly well done. It was almost a participant observer study where you went and lived with people in housing developments, I think one black and one white, and kind of traced what a horrible situation it is and how easy it is to just lose your home when you're in a certain economic strata. Kind of brilliantly done, opening your, our eyes to how that works. Yeah, he, Matthew Desmond wrote right. the book Evicted, uh, which I reviewed for New York Times. And I was stunned by it. I thought after Nickel and Dime, nothing would stun me. But Nick, uh, his book, Eviction, is probably something everybody in Seattle should read. So, do you have another book ahead of you? What pressure, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what about that hedonism part of it? <laughs> you can say no. <laughs> no, I'm not, I, I have a lot of questions in my mind. Yes. And I'm going to, uh, uh, in my time away from family responsibilities and economic hardship reporting project, I just follow my curiosity. Mm. It turns into a book, fine. If it doesn't, fine. So wh what are some of those questions that you still have that you'd like to answer for yourself, or answer for us? Well, answer for myself, primarily. But I'm interested in this question of what do we call alive and what do we call dead? You know, why do we consider rocks, for example, dead? Uh, rocks have been worshipped in many cultures uh, for years, animist cultures, which will say, yes, that, ro that rock is, you know, a holy place or where that mountain is or that river. 
and we have taken the holiness and the life out of the world and put it all, concentrated it all in a distant, invisible God, which is a shame. So I want to look into animism. Uh, the the it's, you know it wasn't really the religion. The Western anthropologists who found it uh, among all the quote natives around the world just thought of it was sort of like a primitive religion. They were wrong, right? When they get it together, they will cons consolidate all these spirits they worship into one God, and we'll get this kind of monotheistic stuff. And I, I want to look at more into that, that change and what it did to our ways of thinking about life and death. I, I'd like to give you a chance to ask some questions of Barbara. Um, is Ware going to moderate this part of the program? If not, I'd be happy to. I think we have some microphones on either side of the auditorium. And uh, if you could please step forward and ask a concise question that Barbara could be able to answer. Could you tell me who you are and what's your question over here? Maybe it doesn't work. There oh, you yeah, can hear me. OK, great. Um, yeah, we are living in a society which is increasingly, you know, have, you have a more and more people who are lonely, especially when they're getting at old age and, you know, maybe the anonymity of the country and people being asked, you know, to move from A to B and, you know. So anyway, my question is, what do you think of, you know, addressing this fear of growing old or this fear of death by living in an intentional community, a community when you're growing older? Maybe it's not for everyone, but have, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Great. I mean, uh, I would think, you plan yeah. even doing that, or? That's, yeah, no, I'm I'm 100% for it if I can find a sort of libertarian socialist community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Right, thank you. Thank Good you. plan. Over on this side, what's your question? What's your name and your question? Uh, hi, Barbara. My name's Elizabeth, and I've long admired your work. Um, my question is with the recent news of the Golden State Killer and the sort of unveiling of the fact that our DNA, that we might be sort of submitting to companies around, you know, learning about our ancestry or learning about the diseases that we might be um, more susceptible to. Um, you know, is that something that, that you would do? And uh, would you share that information in public? Um, Wait a minute, is it, would I go out and kill what it doesn't No, no, no. <laughs> Would you have your DNA tested and, yeah. and the results of that shared? Shared with whom? Shared with whom? Well, I mean, first, would you just, um, you know, have it tested um, mm. with, these, with these companies? And then, um. you know, would you put it online to sort of advance <laughs> science? Probably <I'd> not. <laughs> no, and I've never been interested in the, those genealogy things either. I think we're all pretty mixed up, okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I don't really care about the proportions. <laughs> so no, I would a, not do these Just things. a waste of money. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, some, uh, people um, you know, find out interesting things. My son-in-law, who's half Mexican, found out that his, you know, huge percentage of Native American uh, Stuff. Um, what, what do you call it? DNA and the genealogy. But I don't think I'm going to find anything interesting myself. It's probably going to be, you know, Scottish and Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Next, what's your name and your question? Hi, uh, Amy Hagopian. I'm interested in your thoughts about the difference between life and death, and whether you are taking any steps to prevent being kept alive in some god-awful institution in old age? A good question. You know, you know, a lot of it's MDs who go to extremes to avoid a medicalized death. Some of them have tattooed on their arms DNR, meaning do not resuscitate not trusting that living will. And, and that's something for me to think about. You know, that because once you get sucked into the system and they want, 
oh, okay, should we revive her again so we can torture her more and stuff? Not much you can do. Uh, I mean, I've got my kids to count on, I hope, to kill me. Um, <laughs> but, no, it's very scary. Well, the first part of the question was uh, the difference between life and death. Oh, yes. Uh, well, there are things that fascinate me that I wonder whether they should be categorized as life. And don't laugh. One of the, the things that I want to spend a few weeks anyway reading about is um, black holes in, in space. In the center of every galaxy is a black hole. And what do they do? They eat. That's the word the astronomers use. They go on feeding sprees. And what do they eat? Matter. That's what we are. That's what planets are. So that, that, that scares me. Then I, we learned very recently that they probably can communicate with each other across galaxies through some kind of mechanism. So I, I just, I got to spend a few days reading about that. It may be beyond me to go further, but um, that, that's the, you know, all right, it's a little nuts, but I know that. Hi, what's your name and your question? Monica, uh, so my question is, um, in, in your sort of outlook, it seems like there are a lot of things that we don't need to do. So, you know, we tend to do too much, we can do less. Uh, and so it's more on the negative, like we don't need to do that. But there are things that are actually useful, like, you know, having a reasonable ex exercise schedule, move around, talk to people, be social, whatever. And, and so it seems like it's more of a trade-off issue. So have you thought about, you know, what, what, are, what are the things that are actually good, that is still worth doing? Because you don't want to just sit at home and watch TV all day either, right? Ooh, or follow, wait, wait, or, or, or just, just, do th just watch TV just because you're lazy. So there are things that are actually useful for the quality of life and for the length of life. Oh, yeah. So it's a, it's a trade-off rather. So what are the things that are actually still worth doing? Well, like maybe the green, the green yes. drinks are not good, but maybe exercising it is. Right. And you mentioned exercise is one of the things that is worth doing. Are there other things? And that you'd like to add? Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't think science is prepared to give us the answer. The one thing that seems pretty solid is activity and exercise as a, you know, as a way to prolong your life and feel better now. I do it, but that's because I enjoy it. Um, there's a kind of muscular freedom that we don't feel into in most of the time in adulthood. So I enjoy that, but, um, it's, it, there's no list of, I mean, there are millions of lists. You can buy books called Successful Aging uh, or my favorite uh, title, Younger Next Year. <laughs> it's, so, it's really sad. I mean, that is a, in many ways, a pretty obnoxious book, but it is sad that one of it, the younger co-author of that book died last year of cancer after doing every single thing right. That's not a data point, I know it's one person, but. So everybody is selling their lists of what to do and how to manage your life and live longer. And I'm saying be deeply skeptical. So, so basically it's, it's, a, it's a choice, it's a, go back to the fact that it's a freedom that we have to decide what's, for, what's right or wrong. It's not science that is gonna tell us. Wait. It's not science, it's a choice of what you will do and won't do. Well, do I, am I depending on science? No, she's, she's suggesting that it's a choice rather than science. Oh, it's a choice, ultimately. Yes, yes. But I, yeah. But I, I make my choices based rationally, in part, on science, and also based on slothfulness. <laughs> no. <laughs> not going to do that on time. Uh, I think we'll take one more question. Yes, sir. My name's Don. We have a very expensive health system. And there are people who are terminally ill and that are being offered treatments that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars that may extend their life for a week, two weeks, or an unknown period. Is there a time for the system to say, no, we're not going to provide this treatment because you, you're going to die very quickly? 
The question was, we spend a lot of end money on end of life oh, care. Yeah. Should, should we actually say, no, no we're not gonna spend it, that it's, money? It's crazy, the disproportionate spending on end of life. But that's also part of the craziness of the you know, disproportionate investment in the health of people over 65 through Medicare. Stop me if I've already said this because I've been saying this for you know, a few days on the road, but we, the, the young are neglected in this skewed system. And one, one thing that really, really shocked me recently was the information that maternal mortality, deaths in childbirth or, or around the time of childbirth are, is on the rise in this country. In other countries, it just has gone down and down. We go up, especially among black women in the South. So they're not getting a needed form of preventive care, um, prenatal care, for example, postnatal care, or they're not getting it in, a, or they're getting it in a form that is too loaded with racism for them to want to participate in it. I think both things. Go on. Um, I collect cases when I can find them of children who die because their parents can't afford a dentist to pull an infected tooth. This is nuts. You know, to have so much investment in the in the care of the elderly and especially the end of life cases, and so little investment in the health of the young. Harper, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ross. And Barbara will be doing a signing in the front lobby of the new book.